Hello, and welcome to the virtual Scandinavia House and to this Q&A with the director and main subject of the Army of Lovers in the Holy Land, Asaf Galay and John Pierre Barda. Now screening Hello. nationwide at Scandinavia House as a virtual cinema program. The film follows John Pierre's journey to become an Israeli citizen 30 years after the hit Swedish queer disco pop band Army of Lovers launched into international stardom. This is just one of many different virtual programs that Scandinavia House is offering at the moment. The programs include lectures, literary series, art workshops uh, for children's exhibition walkthroughs, and many others. So please visit ScandinaviaHouse.org for all of our offerings. I would also like to thank Aaron at Chapter Two Films for making the screening um, and this conversation possible. Um, for the audience, uh, please feel uh, sorry, please feel free to write in the chat box any questions you have for Mr. Galai and uh, Jean-Pierre Barda. But I will start off with a few questions for both of you just to get the conversation going. So um, I always like to start at the beginning. Uh, how did this project come about and where did the idea uh, come from making this documentary? So I'm a big fan of Army of Lovers. And I think that I was, after my uh, bar mitzvah, I, after I was 13, they became big in uh, MTV and I heard them and I fell in love with them. All my friends were, were laughing about me. They like Kurt Cobain, they like uh, all this grunge music and I hated, I thought that Army of Lovers are the best. I opened a big fan club for them in Tel Aviv it was me and another friend, not such a big one. And then there was this big, big accident that maybe you saw it on the film about the censorship of Israelism in Israel. And I felt very ashamed. And I wrote them a letter and I told them to come over to Israel and... Uh, and uh, I wanted really that they will come. They never answered me. And uh, as a good Jewish boy, as if this is Rosh Hashanah, I send them every year a greeting, a, a me, a letters. This is, was before email, and say them Happy New Year. Never heard back from them. Then later I got their email, and I sent them emails, and I never got nothing for them and I was keep going and going and going and then one day I think it was four of almost four years ago I sent them an, an email and I got an email back from Alexander Bard and he told me oh thank you very much for keep sending us all this email all these years I have some good news for you come over to Stockholm and then I came over to Stockholm and I met uh, Alexander and, uh, Jean, uh, and uh, Jean-Pierre Barda and they told me about what is going, uh, going to be in the near future that Jean-Pierre Barda will make a, and uh, will move to Israel, will make a Leah. And I was so excited about it. And I said, this is a film. And this is how this project started. Uh, Kyle, I think that you are muted now. Okay, can everyone hear now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And John Pierre, how did you feel about this crazy Israeli kid writing you all these letters throughout the years? I, did you get many of these fan interactions like this, or was this quite unique? Well, you see, Asaf probably did the mistake that he he contacted Alexander, ah. and Alexander did did not tell us about all these greetings and so I was totally unaware about Asab's uh, all, um, letters all the years and, and greetings and all that. So for me that was a new one. Okay. <laughs> Alexander, if Asab, if, Asab, if Asab would have contacted me, he would have had an answer immediately. <laughs> I, I can pretty sure that <laughs> I made the big mistakes all these years. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite funny. Um, uh, so, uh, how long did the film actually take uh, to make? I, it took, I think, one year. 
We okay. started from the days that uh, Jean-Pierre Barda moved to Israel and we followed him for one year. Okay. And also I want to say that the film is a film about a man that is looking for a new home. He had a, 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 he had a home that was his band for over 30 years. He left his home when he was very young mm -hmm. and he found his new home in the band. And later on, when the band, everybody started to change and to have their own project, he's looking for a new home. So the film is, this is the story of the film. Right. And the main subject is Jean-Pierre Bauda, yeah. that, is a, a, that is a great pop star, that I loved him. But the film is not about the whole history, like bio-epic uh, film about uh, army of lovers because uh, there is no all this thing in 1995 they did this album then they went to the eurovision all this uh, for me this this uh, information you can read it on uh, wikipedia or in the gossip places so <laughs> So there is, uh, I know that there is some disappointment from some fans of the bands that they don't have all this fan, but th I think that then that what is make this film very unique, that this is a story that also people that don't know about the band mm -hmm. and, uh, can learn something else. And also people that know about the band having new materials mm -hmm. about them, about how they work, why they choose this kind of music, what was their motto, what the, was their ideology, what was, how they were recording music, how they are performance. This is more important in my, and more valuable for me to understand the band than to know more uh, gossip and the uh, <laughs> facts that you can read it uh, in the Wikipedia. You are I think <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead, John Pierre. I think also for Assant, it was a question of to, to understand this Jewish connection because in in many of our lyrics there is um, there is a pronounce, uh, like for example I pronounce Jerusalem in, in with Hebrew accent like Jerusalem and there's many examples in the song that there is there's connections to to Judaism and to to Israel mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people you know ask themselves that recognize this these signs and symbols that would 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 try to to know why mm -hmm. i mean and of course the one of the reasons is because two of the band members are jewish right right john pierre did you feel was it very easy for you to be the subject of this film i know you have your sort of persona or your on stage persona but was it more difficult for you to sort of drop that persona and become john pierre barda the the subject of this film? For me, uh, I've, I've, the reason I came to a point in my life where I want some change and I want to explore a different side of myself and and also try to find some, I'm, I'm very, most of my life been, has been very stressful and I've been, it's, and it's been very hectic and I've, I found myself in a place where I couldn't, I couldn't do the stressful thing anymore. Mm -hmm. So letting go of, of, of a lot of things that were connected to my persona wasn't, it, it just came nat naturally. Right. That's interesting. Um, and and sorry, sorry, due to my ignorance of Israeli society, I was interested in that, uh, in the scene at the end, did you have to do a, a civil service? Was that mandatory or was that a voluntary type of thing? Unfortunately, I was I was too old. The thing is that you are it's mandatory up to the age of forty seven. Okay, and I'm past fifty. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I only I only had the um, I, I only did like one day and visiting and like volunteering and, and you, there's actually no connection to the to the military work. You as you see in the movie, you do right. like for example, we are packing uh, uh, we're packing for, for field medicines, for mm -hmm. example. Right. And, um, but I, I, the thing is, it's such a big thing in Israeli society. So I, I wish 
I would have liked to have the, that experience, though it's one of the toughest because it's long. It's for, for the boys, it's three years, and for the girls, it's two years. Okay. But I, I, would have, I would have appreciated the experience. My actual plan was actually to do the Aliyah when I was, when I was younger. But okay. things, okay. things turned out differently, and I, I, I decided on, on all the days that, okay, I will do it now. Even though some people said like, well, it's really wrong, wrong time, a, a strange timing because normally you do this in your twenties mm -hmm. or when you retire, mm -hmm. not in your fifties. And that's kind of, that, there's, there's a point in it. It's, it's difficult to restart from 50. Right, right, right. But I was lucky. I, my first year was a sabbatical. I went to Ulpan and learned Hebrew. Okay. Uh, my second year I worked as a gardener an apprentice gardener, and uh, so, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I can tell you that the scene, the people that di di didn't watch it yet, that the scene that's happening in uh, the end scene in, this, in the army when uh, Jean-Pierre is volunteering is one of the best scene ever in documentaries, film in Israel. People are still remembering it. Was it difficult to get uh, permission to shoot there or? No, not at all, not at all. But uh, I think that the more difficult that it's, the, to be in the army, it's very boring that something will happen. And then this scene that I will not tell for the people that didn't watch it happen. And people were like, when they're watching it in the big screens, uh, I, I have the opportunity to show the film for a real crowd, not only virtually, and people are laughing and love this <laughs> scene. And so this will be a question for you, Asaf. Um, yeah. Is this how you visualize the film? I know this was always a thread that you were going to uh, pursue uh, with uh, Jean-Pierre becoming Israeli. Um, I, I will tell you, when, when I uh, had the vision for the film, uh, and I asked, you know, the funders, the, the broadcast, and, and uh, that everybody thought that in the end of the film, Jean-Pierre Barda will say, I hate Israel, I want to go back to Sweden, Israel is so bad, I made the mistakes, and, and the, they were like pushing me and hoping me to, to get something that he will say, no, yeah. I prefer my old life, that this is, will be the end of the film. <laughs> and, and it happened uh, differently, yes, yeah. let's say it. I will not do a spoiler. <laughs> and uh, that's all. And this is, this is another kind of uh, film that I, 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 I didn't envision, but the people that were uh, the broadcasters and the <laughs> film fund were envisioned. Right. <laughs> And Jean-Pierre, I want to go back to your growing up in Sweden. Um, back then, it, it's, it's, the Swedish society is a lot different now. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, new Swedes uh, living in the country. Um, I know there has always been immigration to Sweden. But there's also a sort of a sameness about Swedish society, probably even more so back in the 70s and the 80s. How was it? like growing up in Sweden for you as an outsider? Um, you were a French Jew who immigrated to Sweden. Uh, did you have a, did you struggle growing up in uh, the Swedish society? And um, did that help sort of shape your, per, uh, shape you becoming a member of the Army of Lovers? Well, as much as you say, in those days, uh, there wasn't the same kind of immigration in Sweden. Right. Uh, I, I remember we were the only foreign kids on the block, me and my brothers, where we lived in Stockholm, in the, in the suburb of Stockholm. So it was a totally different climate. And uh, yes, people would say like, well, you're foreigners and stuff like that. And, and I would always say that I'm not a foreigner, I'm French. <laughs> but uh, I was around seven when we moved. And, and in the beginning, I thought it was difficult because it was cold, the food was horrible. And um, I missed, the, I mean, we moved from Paris, which is right. like a, a busy city. And we moved to the, the suburb in Stockholm, which felt like the countryside. 
and it was a strange feeling and it took some time to to grow into it and then i spent my first year in school in sweden was in a swedish public school mm -hmm. and the second year we moved i moved to the jewish school a small jewish school in the center of stockholm and, and that was amazing i mean i went from the, a swedish public school that was a huge school with around 2000 students uh, um, to this small school that were maybe two three hundred students it was like one one class for each year that's it uh, it was amazing hmm. and that that turned things around and i think what was great with that school was it was such a small school that everybody was allowed to 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 develop personalities hmm. because there was room for everybody to be personalities and I remember there was a very good, um, the atmosphere in the school was great. There was no bullying um, and this amazing uh, communal feeling around Judaism. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it was a semi-religious school. So we, we had, the, we did the prayers before eating and we did prayers in the morning, but that's it. Apart from that, it was like the regular, regular teaching and then a little bit of Hebrew. But frankly, the Hebrew for me was useless when I, 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 I we only learned presence. <laughs> so I, I used to joke and I said like, well, in, in those days, we didn't have any future <laughs> or past. <laughs> um, I have an email question from Apollo. Um, and he's asking, now, now that you shot the documentary about your move to Israel, uh, he's ready to hear the rest of your life story. Could you imagine publishing an autobiography like Dominika Przinsky? Uh, oh, this is a good that? question. And this would also mean more great material for another movie by Mr. Galay. Uh, it's a great question because actually it's not only Dominika has written a book, a biography, Alexander has written philosophical books. I'm the only one that, that hasn't uh, <laughs> been writing a book. And, uh, and I've always been joking. I said, if, when my turn comes, it will be a picture book. <laughs> no, uh, joke aside, I think the idea of, of writing a biography is, I've been thinking about it, but there's so much stuff. There's so much, and I don't know where to begin and where to, to end. Right. There is one story that I would like to tell, and it's not so much the story of the band, but it's the story between, about me and my father. Okay and the reasons why i left home and to to highlight the problems when you move from one culture to another culture and you bring the old culture with you and you you grow up parallel with those two cultures and the problems that 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 comes up within the family which was what happened to us i think if we had we if we had stayed in france we i would never have left home the way i did in sweden but Moving to Sweden became too much of a culture shock mm. for my, 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 my father. And he used to say, for example, I, Sweden in the 70s was very liberal. And there was this uh, free education that they called. It was a, um, a more relaxed way of teaching. Mm -hmm. And my father used to say, it's not free education, it's free from education. <laughs> So, and I, I would like to, I, I think if I will write something, it will be more about the story about me and my father. And I also, in a way, he, he passed this fall. Mm. And in a way I feel because I've, 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 I've only came out twice in, in, with two, at two occasions about the split up in our family. And the one is the documentary and one was an, an article, but I was very reluctant doing it because I felt that in all honesty it would my father should be part of that of the of the I was the only one that came to 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 tell and I think my father's side would have been interesting to have as well but nobody ever asked him mm. Mm. Was there uh, Asaf was there any talks about trying to involve the family d dynamic into the film or Family dynamic of Jean-Pierre uh, Jean Pierre's father. Well, the thing is that there is not so much of, as there is not much of a family to build the dynamics around. Our okay. family really crumbled. 
Okay. Uh, my father ended up in France. My mother stayed in, in Sweden. And uh, the, I think the breakup with me and the family caused the breakup of the, the fall of the rest of the family after, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And mm -hmm. in later years, I mean, in the end, I had the, I had the amazing, the amazing, amazing um, gift to get the closure with my father. Okay, good. Which was, which was fantastic. I wasn't expecting it and it came very late. Um, it was like hardly a month before he passed. Uh, Asaf, was there anything uh, that you wish you could have got into the film that you didn't? Uh, there was a, later on when I discovered that uh, Kurt Cobain was a big fan mm -hmm. of Army of Lovers. Really? And I contact and I uh, first I contact the documentary filmmaker Bert Morgan did a great film about Kurt Cobain and he told me there is like great home movies of uh, Kurt Cobain and his band and especially Kurt Cobain singing Crucified and stuff like and uh, dancing so I wish that I could get it uh, this great home movies or to at least to uh, to interview his uh, widow, uh, I forgot his, her name. Courtney uh, oh. Love. Courtney Love, yeah. and she will tell it. So this is the only thing that I feel <laughs> that I missed. Could have been but really it could be in the Army of Lovers, in part the two. Holy Name number two, part two, that will be more about Dominica. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently Kurt Cobain wrote in his diary about Crucified and, and, and the band. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yes which is in a documentary. There was a documentary series here in Sweden about uh, hit, hit, hit songs. Mm. And the one, one of the shows was about Crucified. And they managed to find these pages from, the, from Kurt Cobain's diary. Mm. So it's... In... But I wanted the home movies that he's dancing and singing. <laughs> I would love to see that too. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if oh, we can all start a petition to get those released. Yes. <laughs> uh, is there any questions from the audience? Uh, just please write it in the chat function if there are. Um, I'm also curious about, I, I said I wouldn't talk too much about the Army of Lovers, but I'm sort of curious about uh, your musical idols um, and who did you try to emulate growing up and who do you want to emulate now as, as musicians? Oh, wow. Well, at the moment, this year is the, the 30th anniversary of Crucified. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we've, we've been on and on through the years. And we haven't written any new materials for a long time. But I think we're, we're, we've said that after the corona, we'll see how, how things are. Mm. For the moment, we're just... We're just, um, we're just um, we're in limbo, kind of. Right. Um, I, and my influences when it comes to music, I've always, you know, I, I was listening to, I grew up with my mother's French singers and my father's Arabic music. And I think that influenced me a lot. And then of course, when the, when dance music, the disco era was, I was a kid, but I, I, I only wanted to be, to be grown up and to be able to go to clubs and, and everything. I remember being a kid and reading about Sudi 54 and things like that. I was like, wow, amazed. <laughs> and what about you? Besides Army of Lovers, Asaf, who were some of your sort of musical heroes? Uh, so I st grew up in a very classic music uh, family. My father is a composer, my sister is a cellist, so I was more hearing Bach and Beethoven. So it was a really good short, shortcut to Army of Lovers, from Mozart, Bach, to Army of Lovers. Classics. <laughs> Very short bridge. Yeah. And uh, 
what is oh and abba abba of oh, course of course of course uh, for me uh, i mean yeah I, I, grew, I grew up with abba and as as i have said for him that people said like if you liked army of lovers that was kind of weird mm -hmm. in sweden if you liked abba yeah. you were not you were not the cool kid no exactly everybody was into uh, sweet and and rock bands and glam rock and stuff yeah. like that yeah yeah <laughs> and I was totally, I was totally into ABBA, and I'm still, I still am. I think, I still, I still think they're brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And as artists, I mean, we've all been on lockdown for over a half a year now. Um, are you finding this time alone and sort of isolated productive to your artistic careers, or do you find it more of a hindrance where you can't have the interaction with people as much as you could uh, before? It doesn't. No, it, in that in that sense, it it doesn't it make any difference. At least not for me. I think for for me, on the on the contrary, I'm used. To, I I spend a lot of time by myself. Okay. I like being my by myself. And in those moments, I mean, th those are the moments when, when when everything from from daily life or experiences that comes up to the surface. So you live and then you, you go aside and things mature and, and pop up and something comes out of, out of it. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Asaf? Uh, it's very hard, you know, to do this uh, for an artist to do this virtual screening. Mm -hmm. uh, I, know. I, I miss the audience. I miss to see, to hear them laughing, yep. to see their faces. Yep. It's very strange and... Uh, yep. You cannot shoot a new film, documentary film, because it's uh, who wants it, a crew member, somebody, a foreigner will come over to his house. So it's very strange and uh, I, very strange I think, I think for, for us as a band, it's, it's not only negative, I think there's a lot of possibilities right. to explore new ways of meeting the audience maybe right. not directly live but in, in like with with um, like like we are now interactive by by video and but there's exactly. a lot of lots of other ways also i think right. so right. there is opportunities always yeah, i have one question uh from the audience and they're asking did camilla see the film I don't know. I don't think so because the film is not uh, it's still is still running only on on closed um, right groups. So I don't think she's seen it. No. Okay. And uh, where has the film been screened? I know it was at a a film festival wow. in Israel, but has it been able to make? I think it was it in Atlanta, yet? Philadelphia, San Francisco. Okay. It was in uh, in many places. All already, it's first time that it's in New York, and we are very happy to be in the Big Apple virtually, mm -hmm. and to be in the Scandinavia house. And uh, you can keep uh, looking in the Facebook website for the next film uh, screening. I think it will be in uh, Atlanta, then it will be in Toronto, Vancouver. Oh, nice. Many many screenings are coming up. And has it been in Scandinavia and Sweden? Not yet. Uh, not yet, not yet. Um, and another question just came in, will it be on DVD or Blu-ray? Uh, who has DVD? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> will it be on a, a sort of like a, a more VOD platform? Is, I guess the question is now. Now that we're it will be more in uh, VOD in streaming. Uh, we okay. don't know. There is so many streaming offers for this film. From, oh, uh, but it will be in one of the streaming uh, uh, right. channels that are coming up like mushrooms in the last uh, five yeah. months. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I on, on one way I like it because it can give a film a lot more opportunities than just being selected at certain film festivals but on the other time it's sort of like as you're saying it you lose that sort of big cinematic experience which uh you would enjoy like it would be wonderful to have seen this on a big screen with a good proper sound system you know and here really army of lovers coming at you you know in front of you on the big screen but 
I, I, I'm hoping this isn't going to be the future. This is just a blip uh, on the cinematic map, uh, these VOD services. But this is a good wish for the new year. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, if there are no more questions, I think this is a perfect time to wrap it up. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. wait, we got one more. Um, sorry. Any similarities between Jean-Pierre Barda and the other activists like uh, Beshev Singer, Saul Bellow, and the Fleischmann brothers? No. <laughs> <laughs> Jean-Pierre Barda doesn't have any similarities. He's so unique. Unique. <laughs> Oh, you are so sweet, Asaf. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Asaf. Thank you very much, Jean Pierre. Uh, the film, thank you. The film thank is you. screening virtually uh, at scandinavias.org, um, and it is available nationwide. Bef the first week it was just restricted to the New York area, but it, now it is nationwide. So please do check it out if you want to watch it. Um, thank you again. Um, and uh, I hope to see everyone soon in a very physical space. Thank you very much. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Bye.